including new information that has come to light. In light of that review, I, I think you'll understand, Mr. Chairman, that I'm constrained in what more I can say about it. But I do want uh, the committee and, frankly, I want the survivors to understand how exceptionally seriously we take this issue um, and believe that uh, this deserves a, a thorough um, and full review. I might ask you this. Is there any sense of urgency or timetable to this new criminal review about the wrongdoing by the FBI agents? We take exceptionally seriously our duty to protect victims. Um, and yes, I think you can be assured there is a sense of urgency and gravity with this, the work that needs to be done. I'd like to ask you about one other issue in the remaining minute. I mentioned while she was still here that Senator Capito and I have co-sponsored legislation, the Rise from Trauma Act. Uh, when you read the statistics of the number not only of spouses, but children of those spouses who are either victims of violence or exposed to violence in their lifetime, it is a showstopper. Uh, as a parent, you think back on the experiences of your own youth and those memorable events, hopefully, God willing, they are positive memories, but in many cases they're not. And there's a scar on the, on the souls and minds of these children that has to be addressed or we see terrible outcomes. We're going through a spate of gun violence across America and in the city of Chicago, which I dearly love, which is just incredible. And you wonder, who are these kids that get so mixed up with the gangs and turn to guns and violence, uh, the fight or flight syndrome and everything that follows? What can you tell me about your announcement this morning, uh, additional resources that are going toward the issue of dealing with trauma? Well, Mr. Chairman, as you know, one of the um, founding principles of the Violence Against Women Act when it was first enacted in 1994 and continuing on for 25 years has been to ensure that prosecutors, court systems, victim advocates, um, and all who encounter children who are exposed to violence in the home, um, victims themselves of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, to ensure that when they encounter the system in all of its myriad forms, that those uh, individuals receive uh, the, the service that they are due, meaning that service providers, the prosecutors, the judges have been trained to understand the unique experience that a survivor of domestic violence or children exposed uh, to violence in the home, what that trauma is like and how that should impact their movement, if you will, um, and what they get in the system. Uh, they shouldn't be re-traumatized, Mr. Chairman, by coming forward and by seeking to hold their perpetrator accountable. I've gone over my time, and I'm sorry, uh, just to close by saying, but resources have to be available for analysis, for counseling, for remediation, for mentorship, to put these, give these kids a second chance. Otherwise, I'm sorry to say the results are going to be terrible. Uh, and so I'm glad to work with you and the Attorney General and the President on that issue. Senator Grassley. Yeah. Before I start my questions, I want to emphasize what's been said here, and you've already responded to it as positively and update as you could about reconsidering prosecution of these people that uh, weren't, weren't doing their job and taking action appropriate. Uh, I sent a letter to Attorney General Garland along the same line the very same day, I think, that we had this hearing. Now to my first question. Uh, it starts out with uh, the fact that VAWA has passed the House of Representatives. On that bill, certain prosecutor groups have flagged for us something concerning with that. Business community has raised questions about unemployment benefits uh, uh, that are in that program could undermine the stability of the unemployment system. Uh, I hope that we can reach a bipartisan agreement uh, to move a bill forward. Uh, short of that, I hope we can continue to do what we've done to reauthorize VAWA because it's a very important program that must be continued. Uh, so my question is based on the fact that I believe 90 to 95 percent 
of what on the table in regard to VAWA is agreed to, uh, but then there's certain outstanding things. Is the department supportive of ensuring that the existing VAWA programs are extended, for example, through the end of the year so that the bipartisan negotiations can continue on a longer term reauthorization message? Well, Mr. Ranking Member, um, first I want to thank you for your support in the past of the reauthorization of VAWA and the exceptionally important provisions, not only the, the, um, the uh, major funding and grant, the formula grant programs and uh, important grant programs that provide uh, services to victims, um, but also the rural grant programs, which I know is ex exceptionally important to you. Um, and so I thank you for your work and your support in the past. And we look forward to continuing to work with you and the uh, other bipartisan senators who were here before. Um, I think it's very important that we move urgently to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. And of course, uh, we are grateful that the Congress, when the uh, Violence Against Women Act lapsed, that the um, funding programs were continued to be funded because they, as we know, provide urgent services. But as Senator Ernst and others said, it is very important that we strengthen, improve, and indeed modernize um, the Violence Against Women Act. So we stand ready to work with you, uh, Senator, and others to make sure we can get that done. Okay. Some years ago, this committee approved the Survivor's Bill of Rights for Sexual Assault. Uh, this year, I'm working with colleagues on related legislation that would provide states with additional funding under the STOP Formula Grant Program authorized by VAWA if they uh, adopt legislation to implement these same rights at the state level. I remain concerned, however, that only a minority of sexual assault victims come forward and report the crime. Other than adopting the Survivor's Bill of Rights, what additional steps might federal, state, local authorities take to encourage more victims of sexual assault to report the crime and cooperate in its investigation? Well, first, Senator, thank you for your um, leadership on ensuring survivors, regardless whether in the state system or the federal system, receive uh, the services and the rights that they deserve. Um, I think the simple answer to your question, Senator, is reauthorization of VAWA and it is at the levels that the president has sought because that will expand the much needed, indeed urgently needed uh, services. I spent some time with a number of advocates last week uh, and I heard from them that frankly and unfortunately the demand for services is far outpacing the availability of those services. We have waiting lines at places like rape, um, uh, rape trauma uh, and rape crisis centers, critical rape crisis centers that VAWA funds. So uh, I think the simple answer, Senator, is reauthorization and the increased funding that the president is seeking. Okay, my last question will have to be about the federal courts having authority to award restitution for certain losses incurred by victims of crime in federal cases and the governmental, uh, Government Accountability Office recommended several years ago that the Department of Justice implement performance measures and goals for the collection of restitution. To what extent has DOJ implemented those reforms and what can you tell us about the subject? Um, well, Senator, I, I'll have to go back and look at this, that specific report and our responses, although uh, I know that we take very seriously uh, reports from whether it's the GAO or the IG, and particularly when it comes to stewardship of federal dollars. Uh, could you respond to that in writing then? I'd be happy to, sir. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Deputy Attorney General, it's great to see you here. I, I, I've had the pleasure of working with you over the years. You talked about being a junior staff member here. You were a very vital staff member right from day one, and I appreciate Thank you. being here on this, and I can't think of anybody better to be talking about Violence Against Women Act. It's, it's one of the most consequential pieces of, of legislation within our committee's jurisdiction. Fortunately, last time successfully reauthorized was in 2013. I was glad in that one when uh, Senator Crapo and I 
brought the bill through. We had students, immigrants, LGBTQ individuals, those on tribal lands. And it passed overwhelmingly. But those, those of us who our days as prosecutors saw what happened in violence against women, not a statistic, but actually saw the victims. I talked to the victims, those who were still alive and could talk. So I'm glad you're here. I think you would agree that it's uh, important to not only reauthorize, but improve and strengthen the, the law. Would you agree with that? I do, Senator. And I, you know, I, I think back often to my own experience. Many of us had experiences as prosecutors. We see the impacts of uh, domestic and sexual violence on individuals, on their communities. We also know that one size doesn't fit all in the criminal justice system. I've been looking at things like restorative justice principles and practices. Maybe they can help. Those in power, survivors have a voice in sh uh, shaping the response to harm. And it gives um, them and their communities an opportunity to make sure that those who cause the harm be accountable for their, their actions. I've been working with uh, your Justice Department to establish the federally backed National Center on Restorative Justice. I'm familiar with it because it's housed within the Vermont Law School. The center received initial funding from the Office of Justice Programs, received another Justice Department grant earlier this year to continue, and I appreciate that. Both the House representatives and the White House have expressed support for continuing and expanding it as needed. So, my a long way around to come to the question, we have to reauthorize, we have to improve in the existing law. I think utilizing restorative justice approaches is one of those necessary improvements. So De Deputy Attorney General Monaco, we're working to put, put uh, finalized restorative justice language within the Senate of our legislation. Will you support exploring restorative justice as another approach reducing domestic and sexual violence in our communities. Yes, Senator, and, and just to give you a sense of my thinking on this, I, I start from the premise that the original Violence Against Women Act, at its core, was about improving responses, as we've talked about, improving, improving responses to domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, sexual assault, um, and improving the response of law enforcement in the courts. Um, it had been treated as a private matter, and we had to innovate, and we had to change our thinking. Uh, and as has been noted before, um, earlier this morning, um, the hallmark of reauthorizations of VAWA in the past has been filling gaps and innovating um, and improving and modernizing uh, our services. And what I have heard from advocates and from experts is that uh, some survivors are reticent um, to seek help from the criminal justice system. Um, and so they need other options. I think those options need to be evidence-based, they need to be voluntary, um, but I think a hallmark of violence against women in the past and in the future ought to be being willing to study and innovate uh, and be responsive to what we're seeing on the ground. So yes, Senator, and I'm, and I'm very pleased that OJP and the Bureau of Justice Assistance has been able to fund um, the Restorative Justice Center you mentioned in Vermont. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I, I have a feeling that the, uh, at least the Senate Appropriations Committee will make sure the money <laughs> is there that you may need on this. And I just, and you alluded to this, and I'll, I'll close with this. I think back and with a distressed memory of a number of cases when I was a prosecutor uh, when a victim of violence against women sometimes no longer alive, would come forward and we find this has been going on for some time, and that person never felt they had a place they could go to report it. And I have often said, uh, I was distressed in my, in my office as state's attorney to hear about it for the first time as we're ordering the autopsy. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Leahy. Senator Cornyn. Deputy Attorney General uh, Monaco, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm actually a little surprised to see you, um, given the fact that uh, you refused to attend the hearing uh, where the heinous conduct of Larry Nasser was uh, exposed again and uh, where even the FBI director personally apologized, saying he was deeply and profoundly sorry uh, to the victims of these uh, repeated sexual assaults while they were Olympic athletes. Um, let me just ask you to respond to a statement that was reported in The Hill. Um, this is by one of the witnesses there, former U.S. Olympic gymnast Allie Raisman. Um, she attended a news conference that Senator Blumenthal and Senator Grassley held. And as you know, Senator Blumenthal, Senator um, Feinstein had both written a letter to you and the Attorney General asking uh, serious questions, asking for the, you to appear at the hearing that we held three weeks ago. But Ms. Raisman, one of the re victims of repeated sexual assault by the Olympic team doctor said, the message by them not showing up sends that chi child abuse doesn't matter. She's talking about the Department of Justice, talking about you. I think it's completely shocking and disturbing that they didn't think it was important. What's your response? Senator, um, I think that the women who came and testified here last month are exceptionally brave. Uh, their voices were powerful. Uh, they're, they're, their talking voices about, they're talking about you not showing up. I'm and that that was a, essentially a disrespectful act, um, which did not view the allegations that they have made against Mr. Nasser as sufficiently significant for the Department of Justice to actually show up for the hearing. I'm deeply and profoundly sorry for the fact that the um, victims and courageous survivors, both the, the women who testified last month and the scores, unfortunately, scores of other survivors uh, of Larry Nasser did not receive. Why didn't you or the attorney general show up at the hearing? Senator, I think the um, committee, and I thank the committee for its work, was able to hear from Director Ray and the inspector general. Don't you know I that also you demonstrated profound disrespect for these victims of sexual assault by your refusal to respond to Senator Blumenthal, Senator Feinstein's letter, or to even show and express your personal apology as the public official responsible for supervising the FBI at the Department of Justice, don't you think you showed them disrespect by refusal to show? I mean, no disrespect, Senator, and I am here to answer whatever questions the committee has with regard to the steps the department is taking to ensure that the failures, the inexcusable failures, fundamental failures, do not happen again. I welcome the committee's questions here today on that subject. Well, you're about three weeks too late by my by my count, a lot of the initial failures of the FBI occurred in 2015. Um, we're now in 2021. And despite the Department of Justice's refusal to act on the criminal referral by the Inspector General, now you tell us six years later that the Department of Justice is reviewing new information and has a sense of urgency and gravity over the uh, over these potential criminal prosecutions. You know, I've been in Washington long enough to know there's a difference between what people say and what they do. And when you're talking about a six year delay between the time that the outcry of these victims of sexual assault is made and six year delay between then and now, it's pretty hard to understand or to believe that there is any sense of urgency or gravity on the part of the Department of Justice. What is the statute of limitations for uh, lying to the uh, FBI or from some of the other potential criminal activities that have been charged by the Inspector General again in this case? I believe the statute of limitations, I want to confirm for 1001, which I think is the statute referencing is five years. So here we are six years later. Isn't it likely that any criminal charges for lying to the FBI 
would be barred by the statute of limitations? Senator, Senator Cornyn, I, I really don't want to get into the specifics about what legal theories could be pursued, what evidence may be um, Well, I'm asking pursued. about the statute of limitations. You said it's five years for lying to the FBI. Here we are six years later, and the Department of Justice has done nothing. And you have the audacity to tell us that you are experiencing a sense of urgency and gravity over this. It's simply not credible. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Monaco. Good to have you back in the committee again. Thank you, Senator. Um, we had another exceptionally brave and powerful witness with allegations of sexual assault in this committee uh, before the Olympic athletes, and that was Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Um, in response to that testimony, the Republicans hired a prosecutor to try to punch holes in her testimony. Um, and when that failed, it appears that the FBI tanked the background investigation. Just for starters, is there any reason that sexual assault allegations should be taken less seriously in the context of a background investigation than in the context of a criminal investigation? Sexual assault allegations should always be taken seriously, Senator. And uh, let me thank you for the trickle of information that has begun to flow about the FBI's conduct in that matter. As you know, Director Ray maintained a complete stonewall on information about that investigation during the Trump administration, while at the same time maintaining a fast lane for FBI information related to the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. Why there should be two different gates at the FBI for information related to these two investigations um, is something that we'd like to try to understand further, and I hope you'll continue to cooperate in extracting from the FBI the information that we need to understand what took place. Will you? We will, uh, Senator, and I'm pleased that um, the FBI has um, responded to, I think, your most recent letter um, uh, on this matter has offered a briefing. Um, on the matter, and uh, you have my commitment. We will continue to make sure that we do our very best to answer your questions. So, more generally, I have a letter that I'd like to put into the record, Mr. Chairman, from, it's been uh, anonymized, which I think is appropriate from a victim of domestic violence, um, related to her experience with a Rhode Island group called Sojourner House, which, among its other services, provides transitional housing so that the victim of violence can go and find a place to live while she or he um, works through all the changes in their lives that dealing with that violence threat requires. Um, so I'd like to put that on the record without objection. Um, and relatedly, um, years ago, the last time I guess we reauthorized the VAWA Act, we got my Smart Prevention Act into it, which provides funding to help kids. Right? The woman is often the direct victim of domestic violence, but a child witnessing that violence has been through a terrible ordeal also that can affect them for a long time. Could you speak, please, to the role of housing in providing adequate support for victims of domestic violence and the support that children, particularly very young children, need when they may not be the subject of the violence itself, but they are nevertheless witness to it and traumatized by that experience in their family. Well, thank you, Senator. I'm glad you highlighted this issue because I think too often it's overlooked the ripple effect from uh, domestic violence. Um, and as you rightly point out, the woman is often the direct um, victim, but it does ripple out. And unfortunately, the most vulnerable, the children, are often um, in that wake. Uh, and feeling those effects as acutely uh, as the primary victim. Towards that end, the Violence Against Women Act and its transitional housing program funds much needed, frankly, refuge for people fleeing um, domestic violence and uh, violent situations. Um, I think the latest figure I saw, Senator, is some two million housing nights a year that uh, the Violence Against Women Act's transitional housing program funds through its grant recipients. Um, the President's budget request seeks additional funding, an increase in that, and it's much needed. As I said, I've heard directly from advocates in the last week 
just how much demand is outpacing supply. Um, and so I think you've hit on a very critical issue and I look forward to working with the members of this committee uh, to really making sure we address that issue of uh, transitional housing and having a refuge for women and their children uh, who are too often in, in the line of fire, so to speak, when it comes to domestic violence. Last point in my 15 seconds remaining. The, um, I hope the administration will support the proposed increase uh, in the SMART prevention funding related to child witnesses of domestic violence from $15 million to $45 million. It's a little bit hard when we're talking about $2 trillion here and $3.5 trillion there to imagine that for this population we're at $15 million. Uh, but I hope the administration will support increasing that. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Hawley. Mr. Chairman, I'll let Senator Cotton go next. He was here before me. Senator Cotton. Uh, Ms. Monaco, last week the National School Board, School Board Association wrote to President Biden asking the administration to bring the full force and weight of the feds down onto parents who are protesting various school policies at school board meetings, including the indoctrination of children with an anti-American doctrine known as critical race theory or protesting the requirement that children as young as two be required to wear masks. Now, I think we can all agree that violence is not an acceptable form of political protest and violence can never be used to achieve policy or political goals. But that's not what the School Board Association letter focuses on. In fact, in one example of what the association thinks warrants federal criminal charges, they cite, and this is a direct quote, an individual who prompted a school board to call a recess because of opposition to critical race theory. A recess. The association is asking the administration to use the Patriot Act, a law that this Congress passed and has repeatedly reauthorized primarily to stop the threat of Islamic jihadists to bring criminal charges for domestic terrorism against parents who attend school boards to oppose things like critical race theories or mask mandates resulting in a recess being called. Ms. Monaco, is it domestic extremism for a parent to advocate for their child's best interests? Well, Senator, as you rightly point out, that um, violence is not the answer. There can be very spirited public debate, and there should be very spirited public debate on a whole host of issues. Uh, but when that tips over into violence or threats, uh, there is a role uh, for law enforcement. But Ms. Monica, I'm sorry, my, my time is limited here, and, and I asked a simple yes or no question, and I have several of them that I want to ask, so I'd, I'd like a yes or no answer. Is it domestic extremism for a parent to advocate for their child's best interests? I think um, the what, what you have described, no, I would not describe as domestic extremism. Domestic extremism for a parent to want to have a say in what their child is taught at school. Uh, I think it's important, um, although obviously not my field in the Justice Department, to opine on education policy. It's important um, for parents' voices to be heard. But, Senator, I want to talk about what the Attorney General did do in response to that, uh, so um, I, I the want issue of my, threats. Ms. Monica, I want to go through my question. I, I grant you that no one, no one should ever threaten violence or use violence to try to achieve political or policy goals. They shouldn't, for instance, follow Democratic senators into the bathroom violating state laws. No one should ever use threats of violence or violence to achieve political goals. I'm asking very simple questions here and trying to get the bottom of what was on the Attorney General's mind or the Department's mind. Is it domestic extremism for parents to oppose their children being taught to treat people differently because of race? The Justice Department's job, Senator, is to apply facts to law, not to opine on um, uh, letters that are put forward or um, you know, I think, I think it's very important for the Justice Department well, to... Ms. Monaco, it's a fact that the School Board Association just sent this letter to President Biden, and then conveniently the Attorney General released his letter yesterday desc describing his series of measures to confront this grave and growing threat of parents protesting their kids being indoctrinated in the school board having to call a recess. Is there any uh, connection between those two things? I want to be very clear in the um, memorandum that's publicly available the Attorney General issued uh, talks about the importance of bringing federal, state, local law enforcement together to make sure that there is awareness of how to report threats that may occur um, and to ensure that there's an open line of communication to address threats, to address violence, um, and to address law enforcement issues in that context, which is the job of the Justice Department, nothing more. The United States just saw the largest single-year increase in murders 
on record. Has the Attorney General issued a memorandum describing a special series of measures that the Department of Justice should take to try to address this record increase in murders? Yes, indeed, Senator. In fact, I issued a directive to the field um, earlier this has year. Has the Attorney General? It was on behalf of the Attorney General and the rest of the leadership of the Justice Department to address the alarming rise in violent crime and to lay out a strategy for violent crime reduction, which includes going after and using federal resources to target the most violent uh, offenders, including those operating with guns, including those responsible for uh, murders and violence in our communities. So absolutely, we take the alarming rise in violent crime exceptionally seriously, and indeed, I've heard from the many hours I have spent with law enforcement leaders across this country, how urgently they feel it is to address this rise in violent crime. Uh, and we are working every right, day my, to address my, my that up, challenge. I just, want to, I just want to finish with one final question. Did anyone at the FBI express disagreement or any reticence at all about investigating disagreements between parents and school boards over curriculums and school policies? I don't understand that to have been the, it absolutely was not the subject of the Attorney General's memorandum, but the answer to your question is no. Nobody at the FBI expressed any reticence. I'm sorry, Senator, if you're asking me what was the response to the Attorney General's memorandum, uh, I've heard no, um, no reticence, no concern. Um, the job of U.S. attorneys and FBI special agents in charge to be um, conveners in their community, to address violent issues in their community, is the core job of the Justice Department. All right, then. Thank you, Senator Cotton. And uh, Senator Klobuchar, prior to your arrival, we said good things about you and your work in Iowa. <laughs> well, better than bad things. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership. I apologize for being late. We had having a incredible hearing over in the Commerce, Depart Commerce Committee on uh, the whistleblowers' allegations and statements about Facebook. And I was thinking as I sat there, despite all of the hearings that we've had in this uh, committee, it may be that one person is going to be the catalyst uh, to finally passing bills, uh, not just in the privacy area, which she herself said isn't enough, but in transparency for algorithms and also uh, consolidation, which was specifically mentioned with the dominant platforms. Ms. Monaco, I know we're going to have a uh, confirmation hearing on your new nominee for antitrust, um, but I only lead with that because the violent content is a part of this story as well. Um, I would start with the fact that this has always been a bipartisan uh, reauthorization so many times in the past. Uh, this bill is so important. And in your view, has the pandemic where uh, we saw in my own state intimate partner, partner violence rose from more than 40 percent, rose more than 40 percent in 2020. Has the pandemic increased the urgency to reauthorize VAWA? Absolutely, it has, Senator. Um, and uh, I have been remarking this morning on my discussions with advocates uh, and service providers, the people on the ground doing the work that is so urgently funded by the Violence Against Women Act, they have told me that the uh, demand for services is outpacing um, the um, ability to provide those services, and it's only become more so um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which stands to reason people are uh, at home and um, really you know, um, with, with their abuser in many uh, respects, and, and that is a, a horrible situation that we need to rectify. Okay. Um, for many years, I've worked with Senator Cornyn on the Abby Hunold Act, something that Senator Franken was originally uh, uh, involved in introducing. And this bill would encourage law enforcement's use of trauma-informed techniques when responding to sexual assault crimes uh, to avoid re-traumatizing the victim. Um, can you speak to why it's important that law enforcement uses these types of techniques? This bill was actually included in the House passed reauthorization of VAWA. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your leadership on that issue. Um, it is such an exceptionally important part of the Violence Against Women Act and our approach to these issues, understanding uh, from the survivor's perspective what they are going through when they are interviewed by law enforcement, when they interact with the court system, when they go to get their medical exam as a result of a sexual assault that they have suffered, um, making sure that at every step along the way, the individuals they are encountering understand the trauma 
that the victim and survivor has encountered so that they can take appropriate steps, so they can recognize um, and have their services be, as we say, trauma-informed, where the victim's experience is at the center uh, of the training that service providers um, provide. Thank uh, you. I'm going to, I want to move on please. to something really important to me, um, and that is the fact that Every year, more than 600 American women are killed with a gun by intimate partners, and half of the women killed by intimate partners are killed by dating partners. Um, under when Senator Leahy was chairing this committee, we had a hearing on what's called the boyfriend loophole, which always sounds too positive to me, actually, for what it means. And a conservative witness, actually all the Republican witnesses, I remember Senator Grassley uh, being um, at this hearing as well, um, supported changing this situation. The, as they said, dangerous boyfriends can be just as scary, the sheriff from Racine County, Wisconsin said, as dangerous husbands. They hit just as hard and they fire their guns with the same uh, deadly force. Yet federal law only prohibits domestic abusers from buying a gun if they are currently or formally married, um, if they have ever lived together, if they had a child with the victim. Do you agree that we should update the law, and I know you addressed this earlier, in order to protect dating partners in the same way we protect married partners? Absolutely, Senator. The, the danger and the violence and the risk uh, to uh, the women who are suffering um, and who uh, are uh, killed, we know that women are more likely to be killed if the abuser has a gun, and it's no different if that abuser is in a dating relationship than if they are a spouse. And I also note when the Congress first took action to prohibit convicted domestic abusers, this was on a bipartisan basis, from buying or owning a gun, the restriction applied to people who, of course, already had convictions on the books. They didn't uh, wipe the slate, slate clean. Uh, do you agree that fully addressing the threat means that abusive dating partners with prior domestic violence convictions uh, should be prohibited from buying a gun? That's what's in the bill now, the bill that, by the way, passed the House uh, with dozens of Republican votes. I think it's exceptionally important that we address this loophole. Um, the individuals, as you said, are uh, people who would be affected by this are people who've been adjudicated, who've been convicted and found to be a threat by a court. That's the, um, the issue that we have to address. Um, and because uh, failure to close this loophole is resulting in too many women dying. Really appreciate your leadership and your testimony today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Holley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Monaco, I want to come back to this extraordinary letter a memorandum that the Attorney General of the United States issued yesterday. Practically every day brings new reports about this administration weaponizing the federal bureaucracy to go after political opponents. Frankly, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it in American history. I mean, for those of us who missed the McCarthy era, I guess this president is intent on bringing it to us but with new force and new power and new urgency, unlike anything we've ever seen. Are you aware of any time in American history when an attorney general has directed the FBI to begin to intervene in school board meetings, local school board meetings? I'm not aware, and I'm not aware that that, and that is not going on. Let me be very, really, very Really, this clear. isn't about local school board meetings? That's not the subject of the memorandum? I thought that was in the memorandum. The memorandum is quite clear. It's one page, um, and it asks um, the uh, U.S. attorney community and the FBI special agents in charge to convene state and local law enforcement partners um, to ensure that there's an open line of communication to address threats, to address violence, um, and that's the appropriate role of the Department of Justice to make sure that we are addressing uh, criminal conduct and violence. At, at local school board meetings, let me just ask you this. Is parents waiting sometimes for hours to speak at a local school board meeting to express concerns about critical race theory or the masking of their students, particularly young children, is that in and of itself, is, is that harassment and intimidation? Is waiting to express one's view at a school board meeting harassment and intimidation? As the Attorney General's memorandum made quite clear, Spirited debate is welcome, is a hallmark of this country. Um, it's something we all should engage in. And no, I don't think so, Ms. Monaco. With all due respect, it didn't make it quite clear. It doesn't define those terms, nor does it define harassment or intimidation. It talks about violence. I think we can agree that violence shouldn't be condoned or looked aside from in any way, swept under the rug at all. But harassment and intimidation, 
What do those terms mean in the context of a local school board meeting? I mean, this seems to me, in the First Amendment context, we talk about the chill, the chill to speech. If this isn't a deliberate attempt to chill parents from showing up at school board meetings for their elected school boards, I don't know what is. I mean, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything like this in American history. We're talking about the FBI. You're using the FBI to intervene in school board meetings. That's extraordinary. Senator, I have to respectfully disagree. That is not what- Point me to an instance. The, the Attorney General's memorandum um, made quite clear that um, violence is not appropriate. Spirited public debate on a whole range of issues is absolutely what this country is all about. Um, then why is it being investigated if, by the FBI? If, it is not. When and if um, any um, uh, situation turns to violence, then that is the appropriate role of law enforcement to address it. Um, oh, the what, memorandum what, covers more than violence. It talks about intimidation. It talks about harassment. So I'm asking you to draw some lines. We do this all the time in the First Amendment context. This is the, this is the sum and substance of First Amendment law. So I expect that she'll be available and, and willing to do it now. Tell me where the line is with parents expressing their concerns, waiting for hours in the school board meetings. We've all seen the videos. This happened in my state. Parents have waited for hours. Sometimes the school board meetings have been ended before they can speak because the school board doesn't want to hear it. And now parents are told that if they wait and they express their views that they, they may be investigated for intimidation? I don't know who's telling them that, Senator. The job of the Justice Department is to investigate crimes when uh, a situation turns to violence, when and if a situation turns to violence, it's the job of the Justice Department and local law enforcement to address that. The Attorney General's memorandum simply uh, asked the U.S. Attorney community, the FBI, uh, and their counterparts to ensure that state and local law enforcement has an open line of communication uh, to report threats, whether they um, happen in the context of election officials being threatened, whether they haven't happened in the context of members of Congress being threatened, which the FBI responds to uh, on a regular basis, as is appropriate. The job of the Justice Department is to address criminal conduct. You know, all I can say is this is truly extraordinary. I think you know it is. It's unprecedented. You can't point to a single instance where anything like this has happened before. And I think parents across this country are going to be stunned to learn, stunned, that if they show up at a local school board meeting, by the way, where they have the right to appear and be heard, where they have the right to say something about their children's education, where they have the right to vote, and you are attempting to intimidate them. You are attempting to silence them. You are attempting to interfere with their rights as parents and yes, with their rights as voters. This is wrong, this is dangerous, and I cannot believe that an Attorney General of the United States is engaging in this kind of conduct. And frankly, I can't believe that you are sitting here today defending it. I intend to get answers to these questions. You won't answer my questions. I'm going to get answers to these questions. Mr. Chairman, we need to have a hearing on this subject. We need to hear from the Attorney General himself. He needs to come here, take the oath, sit there, and answer questions. We have never seen anything like this before in our country's history. And frankly, I, I want to say I think it is a dangerous, dangerous precedent. This hearing on Violence Against Women Act will continue. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Uh, great to be with you, uh, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, and I appreciate your appearing before us on a hearing that is about the reauthorization and strengthening of the Violence Against Women Act, uh, a tremendously positive uh, and important law that you helped shape uh, when it was first brought forward by then-Senator Biden uh, in this committee. It's one of the most important pieces of legislation Congress has passed in recent memory. It's improved and protected the lives of millions of Americans and transformed the way uh, that our country and law enforcement advocates and victims think about and respond to domestic violence. It's also, in my view, a testament to President Biden's vision and character, someone who has always had an intense opposition to those who abuse their power over others. It still remains far too pervasive in our country, and domestic violence in many ways has been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. I've gotten calls from uh, the Delaware nonprofit organizations that are both advocates and service providers, uh, and I think it's more critical than ever that Congress strengthen and reauthorize this bill. So uh, let me ask a few questions on that topic, if I might. Um, gun violence is a pervasive um, and tragic, uh, brutal part of domestic violence and gender-based violence. Studies show domestic violence is five times more likely to be deadly if, a, if an abuser has access to a firearm. I was glad to see that the bipartisan House passed VAWA reauthorization 
would require the federal government to tell state and local authorities when a person with a domestic abuse conviction has failed a background check. Um, similarly, um, Senator Cornyn and I introduced uh, in this chamber the Nick's Denial Notification Act, which would require information sharing between federal, state, and local law enforcement when a person prohibited tries to purchase a firearm and fails a background check. Would you agree that giving state and local authorities timely information about individuals who've lied and tried and been denied a firearm can help make our communities safer? Absolutely, Senator. What we need to make sure is we've got the requisite information um, in the systems to ensure that those who pose a risk, those who pose a lethal risk, um, cannot possess a firearm and do deadly damage in our communities. Um, the, one of the roles I play here is as a member of the Appropriations Committee, and in particular the subcommittee that provides funding for federal law enforcement and for the implementation of VAWA. The authorization levels haven't gone up as rapidly as the need. Um, and I've heard from providers like the YWCA, Child Inc., Community Legal Aid in my home state uh, about how this makes a daily difference, the resources that they receive through VAWA. Um, how can we continue to support nonprofit organizations all over the country, uh, a, an established network of providers and advocates, uh, and account for the extra need that the COVID-19 pandemic has placed on them? Well, Senator, um, you've hit um, at the heart of the matter, which is the really um, dangerous increase in the need uh, that survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, sexual assault have, and it's increased during the pandemic, as, as we've observed. Um, those who are um, stuck at home, housed with their abuser, are suffering, uh, and suffering sometimes in, in silence. And so the simple answer to your question, Senator, is reauthoring reauthorizing, excuse me, the Violence Against Women Act and doing so at the $1 billion levels that the President has requested in his FY 2022 budget request. It will provide much needed, indeed urgent, services to survivors, training to law enforcement so they respond and when they do so, they've got the tools, the training they need not to re-traumatize the survivors who they're encountering. Um, and it will do the same with regard to court systems, increase rural funding uh, for these same services. Senator Ernst rightly pointed out that we need to make sure that rural communities get these services as well. And the Office of Violence Against Women's Rural Program does that. We need to increase uh, those funds as well. So uh, reauthorizing the critical and frankly landmark programs of the Violence Against Women Act is, is really what we need to be doing. I was glad this hearing began with a panel of three um, Republican senators here to testifying to the significance of VAWA, and in particular, uh, Senator Ernst uh, talking about her own experiences and now her engagement uh, and advocacy. Let me ask a last question on this, if I might. Many survivors of domestic violence struggle to find rental housing. Um, often they have poor credit or employment or rental histories directly as a result of their abuse. Um, how can Congress ensure survivors don't face uh, needless barriers to accessing affordable housing, which is one of the main reasons um, those who are abused stay with their abusers is they don't see a path forward towards being able to house their family um, free from abuse. You're quite right, Senator. We need to make sure that there's a refuge. There's a safe haven, if you will, um, for uh, people, women and their children, oftentimes uh, fleeing an abuser. And there needs a to be a place uh, for them to go. The transitional housing program that the Violence Against Women Act funds and has funded historically uh, provides um, millions of housing nights a year for just that exact purpose, to give that safe haven. Uh, and we need to reauthorize it and we need to increase the funding to it. Thank you, Deputy Attorney General. Mr. Chairman, could I ask for one minute of forbearance? I guess. Yes, um, I, I, the, the senator who preceded me in questioning you uh, accused the Attorney General and the administration of an unprecedented level of FBI harassment and intimidation of citizens at school board meetings. Is there any foundation to this? Uh, no, sir. Just thought I'd give you a chance to answer that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Coons. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. And uh, also thanks to Ranking Member Grassley. I look forward to us moving ahead. and providing more resources and more support to uh, families and uh, victims of domestic violence. I think over the last 18 or 20 months, COVID uh, has not only uh, taken lives uh, as a result of the disease, but we've seen an increase in domestic violence and child abuse. So it's very timely that we have this hearing and very important that we make progress. I want to talk uh, 
Ms. Monaco, about some of the plumbing that we should look at. You know, we installed the plumbing back in 1994. Um, we had a GAO, GAO report in 2012 that uh, talked about the DOJ lacking visibility over the extent to which the programs overlap. Um, I think in 2018, we had another uh, Inspector General report that 42% of VAWA grants had not been closed on a timely basis. So as we're looking ahead at uh, maybe well-intentioned programs, but maybe they need to be repurposed, modernized, consolidated, do you have any thoughts about what we should focus on in terms of the plumbing of VAWA so that we can get maximum resources to those who need it and free it up to address rule and other uh, other concerns that were expressed in the hearing today? Well, thanks very much, Senator, and I think um, you're quite right to focus on the speci specifics of how we're making sure we're getting that funding out to the people who need it and how we make sure that we're using that, um, uh, those dollars to their best effect. Um, as you know, the Violence Against Women Act funds these critical programs, um, and then recipients of those grants uh, have to file uh, regular financial reports and uh, reports on the services they are providing. The fact that I could tell Senator Whitehouse that there are two million uh, transitional housing nights a year um, with those grant recipient fundings it is because of those reports. Now I think we have to be exceptionally diligent in how we are monitoring the use uh, of those funds, uh, and I'm confident that we have the capability uh, to do that. And I'm also pleased that we have been able uh, to uh, get out the funds for the Violence Against Women Act for the Office of Violence Against Women's um, 2021 funding uh, that would have expired on September 30th of this year had we not gotten it all out the door to the people who need it, and we've been able uh, to do that, and uh, nearly a half a billion dollars in those, uh, in those funds as of September 30th. Thank you. The, uh, I think as we go through this process, uh, it would be very important just to see how the administration of the program and the uh, uh, future oversight can be improved and modernized. We would appreciate that feedback. Ha happy to work with you, Senator, on that. And I know this is an area of particular focus for you. Thank you. Um, also, just kind of curious about DOJ audits on uh, grantees and victims. Uh, it, can you give me an update on, on uh, the audit process and, generally speaking, how the outcomes are, are generally speaking to the outcomes? Well, um, Senator, as I said, the, um, the VAWA programs themselves in the Office of Violence Against Women does require uh, regular reporting uh, on the, uh, the use of the funds, uh, how those funds are being distributed, what services are happening as a result, um, and uh, that's a very, very important part of the success of VAWA, being able to see where dollars are effective uh, and add to those, and where they're not, um, to look at other innovative ways to expand and provide, uh, to provide services. What about uh, things that could help us uh, as we move forward with reauthorization and modernization in the area of best practices? I went to a, a, a facility that just recently opened in West, uh, Western North Carolina, which is extraordinary. Their uh, uh, safe transition, their employment outcomes are, they have to be in the, in the top quartile, if not the top decile. So how could we better understand programs that seem to be working and really try to set that bar high? Everybody's trying to do good. I understand that, but some programs are clearly producing better results than others. So what information could we get from the DOJ to really instruct us on the kinds of things that we believe are leading edge and making sure that our resources are going to the ones that are producing the best results? Well, first, I'd say that I'd be happy to, to give you a more in-depth briefing about how we identify um, the best programs and best practices. I view it as the job of the Department of Justice through the Office of Justice Programs, Violence Against Women Office, the COPS Office, to basically be a force multiplier and a, um, uh, an identifier of best practices, to lift those up, uh, see where great innovative work is being done in the states, in local communities, because that's what it's all about. The federal government um, absolutely uh, doesn't have the best information on this. We need to identify the, the great work that is going on locally, fund it, and then expand it and give it a, a broader audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Before I recognize Senator Hirono, since it has been a recurring theme from some members, 
about the memorandum that was issued yesterday by the Attorney General. I now have a copy of it in hand, uh, as well as the press release from the Department of Justice, which without objection I'm going to enter into the record so everyone can read the actual words printed. And it is worth noting that the opening of the memo is, quote, in recent months there has been disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, staff, uh, who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. Uh, and he goes on to, with more specifics how the Attorney General is seeking to coordinate with local and state law enforcement for the protection of all school personnel. That is clearly the intent of this. Uh, those who believe that it, somehow or another violence or something close to it is uh, a valid use of constitutional right, uh, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, the, there are many who uh, describe the January 6th uh, occurrence here in the Capitol as just a visit by ordinary tourists. For those of us who live through it, know better. And anyone who wants to characterize that as an ordinary constitutional process wasn't here and isn't being honest, whether they've said that publicly or were outside cheering the group on. So uh, I want to make a record of that, and I'm going to add the press release as well from the Department of Justice, which goes into more detail on the subject. Senator Rono, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for clarifying what's actually in the uh, letter or what memorandum that was issued by the uh, Attorney General yesterday. It's always surprising to me that uh, lawyers on this committee don't seem to understand the legitimate exercise of First Amendment rights and people who are threatening violence and, in fact, who, are, uh, who engage in assaults on people. So you would think that... Um, we would all be able to come together to pass VAWA, and I thank you, Ms. Monaco, for your testimony and your responses to the urgent need to reauthorize VAWA and at an increased level because the need is definitely there. One group that I wanted to call your attention to is that uh, there is a, an unfortunately high instance of intimate partner violence within the Native Hawaiian community, which as an indigenous community parallel the high instances of domestic violence experienced by an exhibitor within American Indian Alaska Native community. My office. We can do a far better job. I absolutely communities. I absolutely agree, Senator. It's, um, one of the priorities I laid out in my um, opening testimony is exactly this, making sure that we are addressing uh, the underserved to include yes. indigenous communities. Thank you. And in particular, uh, we need to fix VAWA to ensure that Native Hawaiian organizations are eligible for funding from the Office of Violence Against Women's Tribal Coalitions Program. I hope that you'll give your support to that change. There was some discussion already about um, how women in these situations often do not have options. And often they will leave their job, not because they're fired, but because of domestic violence. And, and so we want to make sure that uh, these victims and survivors have access to unemployment insurance benefits. And I think that that is an important aspect of what we need to do with the VAL reauthorization. Would you agree? Thank you, Senator. I know that the, um, the Office of Justice Programs is, is exploring how we can ensure that individuals have the assistance they need to kind of be a bridge uh, to the services they need to get to. Yeah, so I, I think that we need to view UI benefits as, as more than just in the circumstances where someone loses a job or is uh, fired. Um, we know that uh, protecting immigrant survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking um, is particularly a concern for the immigrant uh, community. Can you talk about how important it is for VAWA to be there for all survivors and also how it's been able to assist immigrant victims of violence? Well, I think what's really important, Senator, and you rightly point out that um, an individual shouldn't be um, uh, kind of held hostage by their abuser uh, and be able, they need to be able to seek uh, immigration 
um, um, uh, relief, as it were, uh, on their own. And I think um, some of the, we'll see where the Senate bill, um, uh, what that yields, but I think it's something uh, that we very much want to be supportive of, making sure that uh, an um, individual who uh, not have to rely on their abuser uh, to file a petition for immigration status. Yeah, I think immigrant women uh, are particularly vulnerable, uh, those who are undocumented. And immigration has become a very divisive issue, and it is really important that we continue to provide these protections and services for immigrant women and for undocumented women in VAWA. I'd ask for your continued support in that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are the questions I have for the moment. Thanks, Senator Rono. And once again, thanks for your patience and waiting. Uh, sure during this hearing. Uh, I want to thank Deputy Attorney General uh, Monaco as well as uh, Senators Ernst, Hyde-Smith, and Capito for joining us today. Statistics suggest that an average of nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner, partner in the United States, 20 per minute. That means that over the course of this hearing, hundreds of Americans experience domestic violence. With the passage of VAWA in 1994, we reduced incidents of domestic violence and significantly improve support services, but there's still much more to do. I, I couldn't start to list the number or names of the organizations that provide services and support to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Many of them have submitted testimony for the record today, and without objection, their statements will be not only entered into the record, but valued for their content. I look forward to introducing the Violence Against Women Act Reauthorization Act with Senators Ernst and Feinstein and many of our colleagues quickly. We want to move on this. We need to get this bill to a president who's anxious to receive it as well and sign it into law for reauthorization. Uh, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, and uh, I really value your presence and testimony today. The committee will stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
not always what you say is what people perceive that you are saying. And so I think this is an incredibly dangerous precedent. And this couple with the lack of respect for these young women that came for the Larry Nasser hearing is something that is not very good for DOJ right now. So let me ask you this. There are teachers that are making lists of uh, their lists. They have lists of parents that they're targeting. Um, so are you all going to invite, investigate them because they're keeping notes on parents of children? This isn't about investigating anyone. So I'd be happy to give you a copy of the one-page memo. Uh, and, and I, I can follow up with yeah. Stephanie. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that that is important to do because the message that you are sending to parents, to individuals, is you take everything that we say, or we're not going to be there to protect you. And I think that that is a very dangerous place to be. And especially, you know, like the Nasser hearing, that is all about protecting young women Absolutely. and girls and showing respect for what they have endured. And the way the FBI fumbled that. I, I absolutely agree. It didn't seem excusable, which is I address here today. Yeah. I address you throughout the way. Uh, and then this memo thing. last night looks as if you were second guessing every parent who is asking the question about what is being taught. So I, uh, I hear you on the misperception, but I would ask you to look at the memo. I'd be happy to get you a copy right away. The memo is, I understand that, but the FBI has no business doing this anyway. Casting doubt on Do parents know? because they are going to question and try to make certain their, how their children are being taught. I just the think... Not, the FBI is not doing that. The role of the Justice Department is to, as I know you well know, is to investigate crimes. It's about violence and that's it. That is not, I, it's but not about are. investigating school board members and I would be happy or to parents. Provide. Or parents. Cool. Parents who are concerned about what their children are being taught. They just want them to be taught and not indoctrinated. Yes, we'll follow up. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. 